Mark, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to come to, to this event. I really look forward to your talk later. Uh, the, the field of, of, of diabetes strikes me as, as very interesting for one particular reason. And it seems to me that there's a divide between those who, who are more interested in understanding the, the biology of the immune system and how to control the immune attack on, on the pancreas, as opposed to the group of people who are more interested in, in regenerative approaches, right? in, in stem cell approaches and, and uh, um, that kind of research. Is that division problematic for the field in general, or, or the two fields coexist peacefully? The two have to come together at some point, in my view, and, 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 and there have been some early moves towards that in, in certain quarters. But, but clearly, um, if, the, if the regenerative biologists and the stem cell biologists come up with uh, essentially a, a new way to, to, to give us beta cells, then the issue of autoimmunity will be staring them in the face if they want to implement those new therapies because the targets, things like insulin, of the autoimmune response, will clearly still be there. So there will be some big challenges. So the question really is, do we, do we spend a lot of time and energy now uh, having, having interactions uh, or do we wait until those possibilities are much closer and then we, we try and work out um, how we might deal with them? I'm more in favor of the, of the early interactions than the late interactions. So we've been, we've been looking at, for example, how T cells might kill beta cells and learning how that process takes place could inform you as to how you might modify a stem cell or a regenerative cell so that it's more resistant to that kind of immune attack. So, so I think early dialogue would be good, but the two have got to come together in my view at some stage. Yeah, and one, one other thing that, that has always caught my attention about the, the diabetes field is that even though there's a lot of progress in understanding the, the immune response and, and there have been a lot of very well thought out trials for different things to, to, to serve this, this population. Things haven't really worked out in, in the clinic the same way that they, that they have worked out for multiple cirrhosis or for, or for arthritis. How do you account for that? Is it a problem of, of re we don't really understand enough of the biology than, as, as much as we thought? Or, or is it just more that the population in the clinical trial is too heterogeneous? W where, where is the, the deal breaker there? It's probably a bit of everything. Um, I think what we're looking at with our current approach is a very late stage of disease where it's, it's quite hard to stop the train that's, that's been going for a few years that is leading to beta cell destruction. So, um, you know, we're stacking the results against ourselves, particularly when we try and do things that are um, uh, potentially, uh, you know, going to lay some good groundwork, like inducing tolerance, but maybe don't have the power to stop uh, an active immune response in its tracks. And then uh, on the other side, the therapies that will stop an immune response in, in their tracks um, we have to really balance uh, risk and benefit. And, and so the, the, the failures, I think, have been because you can't go um, completely full on with, with immune modulation and, and immune suppression because, it, you know, after all, diabetes is not going to kill you in the first five or ten years of, of having the disease. So you don't want to immunosuppress too strongly. But on, so, so by pulling back a little bit, you don't get the full benefit of that approach either. So we're caught, I think, between um, some very strong approaches, but we don't want to take the risk, and some weak approaches, but they're not appropriate for that stage of the disease. So there is quite a lot of um, thought that we should do our studies at that stage of disease, at, at diagnosis, because they're going to inform us about processes, about um, markers and so on. But we should really be looking to track back in the natural history of the disease as early as we can to get to the point where we are, we've identified subjects who have autoimmunity against the islets who are going to get diabetes, but, but at that stage still have plenty of beta cells left. That's the point when we think our, our best chance of intervention is. So then you could come in with, with something that doesn't need to be quite such a hard hammer, but might give you a, a longer term benefit and, and, and set up a platform 
for the immune response to to sort of change its uh, its uh, its um, its trajectory. Yeah, in that regard, your your approach uh, focusing on tolerance is, is quite quite original compared to some of the other things that people have tried in the in the clinic. Another of the things that that people seem to be thinking about also in in the clinic is the idea of doing combination trials, and I guess there's more and more traction because failures carry on piling up. Are you hopeful of those trials, or, or do you think that uh, the, these fundamental problems you just outlined is going to prevail and, and, and lead to another failure? No, I'm a great advocate of the, of the combination approach. I think it's, it's, it, it's the kind of disease that, that really is crying out for that. Um, the hurdles there are the obvious ones. You know, putting combinations together is, is both um, a challenge at the experimental level, at the design level, but also at the regulatory level. And then at the level of engaging the different um, uh, owners, if you like, of the, of the different uh, com compounds that you want to use. So all of those issues, the community is beginning to, to face up to and grapple with and deal with. And it's quite an exciting time. I think there are a couple of agencies, um, for example, the Immune Tolerance Network and Diabetes Trial Net in, in North America, both of them very, very actively pursuing rational combination therapies. So I think we'll see more of that in the next five years. Yeah, returning to the issue of, of, of tolerance, and, and without being too, too technical for our audience, <laughs> there's no need to that for, for that. Uh, as, as you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies now are beginning to think about not the specific diseases, but more about the autoimmunity pro problem and how can we identify a pathway that may be common to the different to the different diseases so that if we target one then we'll have a drug that yeah we'll still have to try it in multiple sclerosis or in, in whichever condition but then we'll just look for a label extension which is much cheaper much more efficient and then it will lead you to the blockbuster the question is twofold is tolerance the place to look for this kind of of all-encompassing uh, therapeutic or do you think that the fact that, that diabetes has always escaped to, to the successes of things like rituximab that have worked in more than one diseases will always place diabetes in, so, in, in its own kettle and there would not be a, a, a similar, a, a shared pathway between this condition and, and the others? I think the thing that really does distinguish diabetes from those other diseases is the, is the autoimmunity aspect, the very clear evidence very early on in the process that there are specific targets that we can measure the immune response against those targets. And you don't really, um, you don't really, you don't really have that in some of the other conditions. So that makes me think that the, um, the that there needs to be a focus not on, on general aspects of tolerance because ultimately that's immune that's an immune response that you're going to be interfering with but a specific immune response is really where we want to be targeting our therapy so I like the idea that we we, we target tolerance yes but but in a, an antigen specific way and that might mean that we need to get rather cute in the way that we put together the, the kind of blockbuster agents that the pharmaceutical companies are developing and the more um, uh, subtle agents that, that the the academic community is, 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 is sort of pushing them towards using in combination. That, that might be a, a sort of win-win situation. Yeah, so you wouldn't discourage the, the companies from, from looking for this magic bullet? Do you, do you think that there might be some... I, I, can, I can see the imperative. Um, they are best placed to do that if they give, some, give us some agents that we can use in combinations then, then yet, as I say, that, that could be a win-win. They, um, we, we, I don't think we're going to get away from the, from the fact that that's, that's the pattern of, of, of the game at the moment, that, that initially we adopted in to diabetes agents that were successful in transplantation and so on, and now we're getting agents that are successful in other inflammatory conditions. I don't think anybody's going to design, um, an agent for diabetes quite like that. So, so I think we accept that we've got to kind of pick off the shelf all of the best agents for us. It's about getting their engagement and understanding that, that they probably don't have a single blockbuster, but, but if, they, 
if they um, if they're prepared to to think about combinations, then they could still be part of the success. And ultimately, um, some of us think it's about you know changing the course of a disease and not about making money. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Mark. I look forward to your talk later today. Pleasure.